Hey everyone, it's Gary. Hope you all are doing well. Welcome to this week's live Path of Prosperity uh, webinar. Welcome aboard to all of you who are in the Investor Agent Trainer Program. Also, those of you who are in uh, the Flipping for Profits Program, uh, Wholesaling so Everybody Wins, uh, Turning uh, Rental Problems into Real Estate Profits, and of course, Real Estate Profits uh, uh, Without the Heartache. <laughs> Actually, it's real estate profits, uh, rental profits without the pain. That's the last one. So in any case, uh, welcome aboard uh, veteran agents and investors and brand new folks alike. Uh, so let me just double check here real quick. Make sure everything seems to be working OK on this end. Hang on one second, guys. Let me just check audio, video. OK, so let me give you my weekly message to make sure you're OK on your end. So hang on just one second, guys. Let me take this in. You see my screen and hear my voice. Okay, so I'm going to close it out, open up your question box, make sure everybody is okay. Uh, so if you could type in, uh, just let me know that you're all good to go. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, really good subject tonight. Subject, excuse me. Uh, it's there are 10 tax strategies. Uh, I'll probably do the more complex one first. <clears throat> uh, there's another one called cost segregation. It's basically com componentizing. I'll go over it probably midway through. It's really not that complex, guys. Once I show it to you, it'll make a lot of sense. The others are really easy, simple things that you can do uh, if, if you have income producing properties. I mean, whether you're flipping homes or you have uh, rental properties, um, depending on how you structure, you should always set them up in, in LLCs, by the way. Um, there's a lot of tax advantages you, that you have available to you. And also, a uh, real quick lesson for everybody. For every one of you who's an agent, um, I highly encourage you to set up your own LLC that's structured like an S-Corp, okay? Um, LLCs, like the, probably since the 90s, probably the greatest thing that's ever happened to us, particularly small business owners, entrepreneurs, uh, probably ever, right, when it comes to, real, uh, to tax law. The reason is, is uh, you can set up an LLC and then you don't have to necessarily designate what it should look like for tax purposes right away. I mean, you, 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 you they want you to, but you can you can do that at tax time. Um, and you can also change it. There's a way you can change it. But here's what I'm getting at. Uh, in in the real estate brokerage business, whether you had you're doing brokerage for sales or any commissions, you're doing property management for fee income. OK. It's a service business. S corps are ideal for a service business. S doesn't mean service. It means small, small corporation. But what I'm getting at is um, there's other tax advantages you can take by having an S corp to run your commissions through, even though you're you're an agent with another broker. A lot of you are Keller Williams, um, like me, but we got folks on that are you know Berkshire Hathaway, you know Caldwell Banker, Remax, EXP, Exit. The list goes on and on. Um, when you run your commissions through an escort, you get other tax advantages there. One of them is the very first one we're going to go over tonight. OK, you, you can basically um, I hate to use the word avoid, but you can you can sort of move past passive loss limitations when you're in the business. OK, and I'll explain that in a minute. So before we do it real quick, let me just um, check the attendee list. Um, let's see. Oh, good. We got some of the newer folks. Hot dog. Um, I'm glad some of you literally just joined like in the last couple of days last week, which is pretty, uh, uh, pretty prophetic. A lot of people, they, um, the, the event this weekend, of course, you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday at Anaheim, uh, I think there were like 120 something registrants. Now, typically about, you know, two thirds will, will show up just the craziest thing, but that's what happens. But in any case, uh, a lot of preparation for that. Um, and it's going to be a great three day event. I'm looking forward to seeing you all there. Uh, if you want to go again, they actually do let you go if you want to. The next one's going to be up in the Bay Area, June uh, 14th, 15th, 16th. I think that's what it is. Uh, I believe it's Father's Day weekend. So, in any case, uh, real quick, I just want to make sure everybody's okay. Uh, boy, I see some brand new people, some guests. Okay. Um, Marina, how you doing, Marina? Good to see you on here. Okay. Uh, and Rita, I, I wanted to see if you had your call with, with Jody, because you and I should really have a strategy call. Um, 
as, as soon as we can to get you into the into taking action, okay? Getting some marketing going on there. So, in any case, uh, Pam Brezio, always good to see you. Welcome aboard. Um, maybe you'll come to the one in San Francisco. Actually, Pam, if you want. Um, there was one event we're looking for, potentially Philadelphia, uh, first weekend of November, first, second, third. I, unfortunately, we may be moving that down to Dallas. Uh, not a bad place to be that time of year, by the way. Pam. Ramon, good to see you, buddy. Hope that call was working for you the other day. Uh, Robert Latham, good to see you. Robert Usdike. Shannon, good to see you, Shannon. He's trying to look forward to seeing you this weekend. Um, can, let me know if uh, you're able to use any of what we went over last week, Shannon, with your client interactions. So that would be great. Um, to hear of Vivian, well, we got a great mixture of folks here, people from all over. You and you and veterans. So in any case, hey, real quick, guys, before we get into the content. Always, for the new folks especially, always make sure you look for the email the next day from Beverly after every weekly webinar. Um, she's going to give you the recording of the webinar, but also, more importantly, uh, updates to the systems, the platforms, scheduling updates, um, just all kinds of stuff in there. So please always look for that. Um, of course, if you're listening to this in recorded mode, you already have gotten the email, but this right now, as of now, uh, this is live. This is you know, 4.07 p.m. Pacific time on uh, Wednesday, April 3rd. <laughs> so just give you some bearing whether we're live or recorded, okay? Live or Memorex. So in any case, uh, look for that, guys. Uh, appreciate that. If you could do that, it helps um, the folks behind the scenes uh, help us uh, move along as fast as we as we do. So in any case, um, let's do this. Um, I'm going to jump into this past law limitations here real quick. Uh, actually, sorry. Real quick, if you could, if you don't mind, let me check questions first. I apologize, I almost forgot that. So let me go to questions here, guys, and we'll jump into the content. Um, okay, looks like everybody is okay on your end. Uh, Shannon, oh, good, Shannon. Shannon's got one already, right? So uh, me too, Gary, looking forward to it. Yes, the webinar content last week has given me a lot of confidence and an excellent process for working with the prospects. Thank you so much. We are very welcome. Uh, okay, this is from uh, Robert. Uh, let's see. Robert says, do you have an actual timeline for this weekend? Uh, they, What they do, Robert, is they, um, and I always wonder why don't they really publish an extremely detailed timeline on these things? And now that I participate, I actually teach, probably be teaching probably half of it this time, maybe a little bit more. Um, it, you'd, you'd be, it, it's amazed how much goes into one of these events. It's just, it's just a huge effort. And then what happens is we, we have people coming in to teach specific subjects like um, 1031 exchange, buying within soft directed IRAs. There's another process you can use as an extra strategy which allows you to delay taxes, to <coughs> me, like an exchange, but it's actually a, a loan sale. It's not an actual exchange. So in any case, what happens is all of a sudden we're juggling, you know, six or eight people schedules. So it's just, it's just almost chaotic, Robert. I wish I could tell you it was, the smoothest, easiest thing in the world. It's actually not. So even as of today, there were scheduling changes coming out. Now, my part, here's what I can tell on my part, right? Um, uh, Friday before lunch, I'm going to go into wholesaling in detail when it comes to agents serving other wholesalers and also agents wholesaling themselves, because that strategy can also be used for non-agent wholesalers, okay? Right out of the gate, we're going to do that uh, uh, that morning. The afternoon, I'll be going into rentals, okay? Uh, that should be after lunch. Uh, let's see here, Saturday, uh, flipping in the morning, um, <clears throat> Saturday afternoon, uh, that's the guy talking about this alternate to 1031 exchange, as well as a guy named uh, uh, Diego Corzo. Guys, Google Diego Corzo. Real interesting, he's one of the DACA guys. He's a dreamer, and he's he's crushing it. I mean, he didn't come here on his own. He was brought to Paris for him here when he was a toddler. He didn't know what was going on. Um, but he's really living the American dream, and I learned a lot from him. He's in, there's a master of my group. You'll meet people from there this weekend that I run. In fact, you guys get to be part of that if you want to. And there's another level above that. There's actually two levels. The next level, I've got other people coming in, um, and Diego is one of them. He's at that level, and he's going to uh, uh, give you a real heartwarming speech, just like a keynote speech. Um, speech, excuse me. Let's see. Sunday, I'll go into into the investor agent more detail, and also we're going to have uh, uh, two other guys come up to talk about uh, Airbnb, 
a Sunday morning and then also commercial. So um, we're developing new products. And the cool thing is for all of us, I'm, I'm just like you, I'm a product of the product. I was in the original pilot program. Um, we're co-developing these programs on Airbnb, on commercial, different subjects coming up. And you guys get to be part of that development. I'll explain more down the road. We just got to get past this event. Uh, but you're going to get to meet these guys and hear what it is they're doing. Okay. And then down the road, as things come up, that's one of the biggest benefits of being a member is you, you get to participate in development of new products. They don't just create this stuff and roll it out and sell it. So you get to be part of it. In any case, that's going to be Sunday morning. So, so Robert, that's kind of the big picture. Um, uh, again, Friday's more about wholesaling and rentals, as well as some two other subjects uh, from guest speakers. And uh, for Saturday, um, flipping Diego, the alternative uh, sale or extra strategy alternative to uh, 1031 exchange. Also more the mindset. Uh, we'll talk about the mastermind too uh, for you guys. And then Sunday's uh, more of the specialized subjects, um, Airbnb, commercial and then of course i'll go i'll wrap things up with investor agent and tie it all back together so the last session on sunday is where you finally get to tie all the pieces together it's, it's, it's the way it's laid out it's structured it's just like the class i teach for you in person this is that times 100 and it's called progression-based learning so it'll as the weekend progresses more of the aha moments will come forward to you and you'll see more of the bigger picture my vision for you is your vision is going to expand that's what happens with these two and a half day educational events. So it's amazing when people walk out of there, the, the, the feedback that we get on this in the comments. <clears throat> it's not me. Um, it's the way it's structured for us. So, uh, so I'm glad to be part of it. So in any case, uh, thanks Robert for the question. Okay, so real quick, let me go into a document here. Now this document guys is on the My Investment Services website. Let me just go there real quick and I'll show you, okay? So you go to My Investment Services. There it is. Okay. Click on Members Area. I'm going to go through this fast because I just I want to get into the content. And every one of you by now should have been in the Silver Level. So uh, go into the Members Area homepage. Click on Silver Level. We're all the default Silver Level members. Okay. On the left hand side, scroll down. Go to marketing techniques and docs and click on that. Okay. And then scroll down here and you'll see different things you have available to you. But right here it says tax strategies for class number one. Okay. So I'm not going to click on it because I've already got it clicked on and opened up, but that's where you're going to find this. So, so Beverly doesn't have to send this out to you. you, you we've all got it available to us already. So let's go to that document. Let me uh, reduce this so you can see the whole document. Okay, first things first. What I want you to do right now, guys, is get out your pencils and your paper um, and just jot down a few key points, okay? Remember, the document is available to you already. You don't have to write all of this, and I want you to do more listening in this part with a few key words to write down. Then later on, you can read the whole thing yourself, and it'll make a lot more sense, okay? So this is called uh, uh, avoiding passive loss limitations. And what this means is this. When you own rental properties, okay, you're, you're gonna have certain losses. Uh, now, just a quick history. Back before 1986, there were a lot more, we call them paper losses. They were just, you know, advantages that the IRS gave us for the, for the privilege of owning uh, real estate, investment real estate. So for example, and it's a, a, an example of one of those today is called depreciation. There really is no loss. You don't actually lose money on depreciation. It's just a phantom write-off. So, so if you buy a million dollar property, you get to depreciate that over the next 27 and a half years. So if you might imagine, that means every year you get to write off about $35,000 roughly speaking, right? So 27 and a half into a million is about 33 or something like that, 33,000. So on your tax return, you get to count that 33,000, that 127 and a half of a million as if you had an actual loss, an expense, but you didn't, you just, it's a paper write off, okay? Um, in any case, uh, uh, more to that subject, I guess I should probably explain this, okay. All right, depreciation, I just told you what it is. It's a, it's a phantom write off, it's not an actual dollar expense or a dollar loss, it's just, you every year you get to say, 
one twenty-seven and a half and a half of whatever you pay for the property, you get to deduct as if it's an expense. It actually is an expense. Now, since I mentioned, I better explain more, more fully. I opened up a can of worms here. That money is not free money. It's not like you don't have to pay taxes on it. You're just delaying the tax burden. So let's say you own the property for 27 and a half years or 28 years, and you've depreciated it every single year. Well, that million dollars was originally your cost basis, okay? However, if you depreciate it through the life of that property, 27 and a half years, and then you go to sell it in year 28, year 29, your cost basis is not a million dollars. Your cost basis is zero. What that means is when you sell the property, let's say you sell the property for two million, right? So 28 years ago, you bought it for a million. You sell it now for two million. You, on paper, you, you're thinking, yep, I double my money. They bought it, bought it for a million, paid two million, okay? Well, if you depreciated that, if you claim depreciation expenses every year for 27 and a half years or the first 28 years, the IRS is going to just call it, you have to recapture that. It's called uh, depreciation recapturing. They're going to basically reduce all those years of the, the 33000 you wrote off, add it all up, deduct it from your original cost basis, which makes it zero. So now when you pay tax, capital gains tax, you're not paying just capital gains tax on the million above you sold a bottle for one, bottle for two. You got to pay capital gains tax on the whole two million. Okay. <laughs> so. In any case, I just want to explain that, but that's an example of a what we call a, a passive loss, okay? Now, um, back to the, the subject at hand here. So, all things considered equal, what happens is uh, every year you get to write, you get to basically deduct $25,000 in losses. Let's say you own property, you're, you're collecting rents, um, and you add up all your rents, and then you deduct your expenses, which are your, the real expenses, you know what I mean? Um, you know, maintenance, repairs, water, sewage, garbage, all that kind of stuff. Those are real expenses, money that came out of your pocket, came out of the rest. Okay, so you have, an, you have a gain at the end. You got a net, there's a the net between your rents and your expenses, that's what you get to keep. Well, there's other write-offs, like I just described, depreciation. So let's depreciation, you know, that what's called a passive loss accumulates to greater than twenty-five thousand for the year. Well, the good news is that you get to write off twenty-five thousand. The bad news is the IRS is not looking to let you write off anything more than twenty-five thousand. Now, just hold on so I can further explain this. That's just on the surface. There are income limitations on this, so I'm going to give you what it was up until last year. Okay, remember last year a brand new tax plan came out, so I'm going to show you that here in a minute. What it was is if you were married filing jointly and you, you as a couple, made $150,000 or more in a year, you couldn't write off that $25,000. They're not, they're not going to let you, okay? If you're a single person making seventy-five grand, then that's your limit there. Well, the new tax rule, let me just go there, okay, says this. This is going to be good news for some of you, but I'm going to unfortunately put a pin in your, air, in your balloon here in a little bit. Um, Look at look at what happened here uh, in the new tax plan. Okay, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act (TCGA) 2018. Okay, uh, took effect when it did not alter uh, passive loss rules. However, they changed the dollar amounts. Look what it is now. Uh, you can, if your income um, is now five hundred thousand or more then you can't take that passive loss. So that's your dramatic increase from 150,000. I think that's good news because guys, that 150,000 has been in there for a long, long time. And a lot of us on this car here tonight are from California, okay? And in California, in, in, a lot of, in a lot of area, most areas, in fact, now if you own a home, chances are you're a millionaire. Just by the virtue of the fact you own uh, probably a million dollar house, right? So, um, but if and your income is typically higher, your income is going to be higher in parts of California, New York City. Uh, and by the way, for all the Canadians on the call here, um, believe it or not, some of these rules do apply in Canada, too. In fact, what's interesting, I'm in Canada right now. <laughs> um, I'm about two hours west of Toronto. I just did a, uh, my, one of my other masterminds. I've been we met Monday and Tuesday or right in the next room to me is a Canadian tax account. Right. So he's working on that. I'm in here working on this. Um, 
So in any case, just, uh, I'm going to focus on the U.S. Uh, rules here. So what I'm going to get at is uh, that that old limit, that old income limit was was old, right? Um, so in any case, uh, uh, you can if you as long as you make less than five hundred thousand jointly, you can take your passive loss, your passive losses, or if you're single, it's two hundred fifty thousand. I thought that was pretty good news. Now here's the bad news. Check this out. I just pulled up the 2018 form 8582, and it doesn't show that 250 on there. It shows 150, right? So this is what you're, you've got to basically do the math here. And so if you're um, enter 150 is your limit. Now, I, don't, I haven't gone through this. That's I'm not doing this right now on the, on the, on the workshop. Um, I have a whole, I have a team of people that, uh, that does my taxes in the States. They're going through this. And they're figuring all this stuff out. So what I'm here to tell you is it looks like officially that's part of the code. It unfortunately looks like uh, whatever form I got a hold of and went right to the IRS. Here it is right here, irs.gov, publication 8582. It's not reflected on here. So go figure. In any case, um, back to this. Let me go back here real quick. Uh, oops, sorry, wrong one. Um, there is something else you need to consider here. Now, most of us are real estate professionals, okay? We're investors, but we are also real estate agents. Now, if you're not a real estate agent, um, just have heart. I'll show you what you can do here. Here's what I'm getting at. In order to avoid these limitations, if you can demonstrate that you work, in this case, um, if you're a real full-time professional person, you've only got to be able to document 751 hours on an annual basis that you're a realtor. Think about how many people have regular full-time jobs and are a realtor part-time. In fact, I just did a recruit today in Virginia. Um, this nurse found me online and we connected online. And next thing I know, within the hour, I've got her talking talking to the Charlottesville Market Center team leader and uh, likely she'll be in my downline. Um, but in any case, she's gonna do this part-time. She's a single mom, you know, trying to raise kids on her salary. She needs extra income. And uh, so this is what she's gonna do. I guarantee you she will get 14 and a half hours in in a week. Okay, and I'm just, just, that's not hard to do. That's two hours a day, essentially, two hours a day. And I'm telling you, I got my license years ago when I was still working, and I definitely worked two hours a day using my license um, for 18 months, and then I did it, um, then I retired from the corporate world, and the rest is history. So in any case, what I'm getting at is um, uh, the actual rule. Let me go back here real quick. Um, there's two actual two parts to this. Okay, um, if you're like an owner, you just own your own real estate, and you're doing your own management. As long as that you got 500 hours in in a year, okay, that's the rule there. Uh, let me see if I can find that in here documented. Um, it's 500. It's 500 hours. I don't know if I'm going to see it in this. Here it is. Just saw. It. Sorry, excuse me. There it is. The most commonly used test is a 500 hour test. You materially participate in any business in which you work more than 500 hours during the year. So what that means is if let's say you're not a licensee and you own your own properties and you do whatever, you're doing your own property management, maybe you set up a separate LLC to do management for your own properties, which is not a bad idea. That's exactly what I did. Got some extra tax benefits as a result of that, okay? Um, but if you're gonna consider yourself a professional, okay, the cool thing is, uh, you, here it is right here. If, uh, even if, uh, note if even if you work for 500 hours, rentals income remains passive. The only exception is if you qualify as a real estate professional. To do so, you must spend 51% of your time um, in the, the measurement of 751 hours. That's what we were just talking about. Working in a real estate business. And that business can be, let me go back here, and Alicia's out for here. Investors who do rentals, management, rehabbing, wholesaling, retailing, foreclosure, short sales, sell stores, and other types of real estate activities. Um, where was uh, brokers? Maybe that was in the other document. In any case, uh, brokers is in there. They listed brokers as one of them. Um, in any case, I'm trying to find out if I can see if I can find that. But uh, the bottom line is this, guys, is the workaround is doing exactly what you're doing. You're a real estate professional. Now, remember I said earlier, I think you should set up a separate LLC structured as an escort for tax purposes. That's for the brokerage end of your business, for you using your license for yourself and others and generating commissions from that. You should run those commissions through that separate entity, okay? Um, 
there's there's one or two states that have certain rules about that. And New Jersey is one of them. Uh, if I was to guess, the other would be California, but I'm not quite certain because I'm just not remembering right now. But in case, always check with that. Check with your check with your tax account. Check with your tax attorney too. All right, real quick, I'm going to just do a real, real quick pause here, guys, um, and check for questions. So hang on just one second. I promise I'll do this for every uh, every session. This so I do have a question for Robert. Robert, I didn't see this before. I'm sorry. Uh, yes. So guys, on Friday and Saturday evenings. Their receptions. Friday evening is open to everybody uh, reception. We also got a, a secret guest there. Um, I'll just tell you his name. His name's um, Chuck Bushback. He's got an ESPN program. Um, he's a, a, a consultant and a, um, a trainer uh, for professional athletes. He's got some awesome stories. And everything that he talks about and applies, it's all about what's up here. It's not, it's not how big your muscles are. It's what's up here and what's in your heart. He's going to go over that with us at the re the Friday night reception. That's Friday night. Saturday night, guys. That's what that's for is um, it's for the the mastermind members and those who uh, want to be in the mastermind. So um, Saturday, uh, you can you can choose to be there. I'll, I'll, I'll if more will come this weekend. But what I'm going to do is um, uh, they always open up the mastermind. Uh, to, to new applicants at the four at the three day events. They don't do this any other time of year. They don't. You can call them today and they'll say no. You can't do that. Um, they're pretty strict on this stuff. Um, I've actually got to show you what it is first and how it works. Then you can fill out a like a profile. It's not an application. It's a profile. And then if you do that, you get an interview, um, and you can be at that reception Saturday night. And then at that point, you get to meet with the other guys. And I'll I'll just tell you, it's a good old fashioned. Uh, let's get to go each other kind of thing. The old saying is, you know, dogs sniffing each other um, because the, it's a pretty tight knit group and they're um, and they have voting rights. So and if you do that, you will get a voting right too. you get to be part of this thing. And it's pretty awesome. This is the difference between um, battling out for individual commissions to really building a, a business around yourself that involves all the different aspects of a uh, brokerage rentals, flipping, managing rentals, wholesaling. Um, you'll see more on Saturdays. It's a, it, it, literally, I could spend all day talking about it. Um, I'm a product of the product there too. I mean, I'm, I belong to three different masterminds right now, different levels, all the way up to 100,000 um, bucks. The one that they make available to you is the entry level one. So in any case, uh, that's Saturday night, Bob. Um, I would say uh, if you have a sincere interest, if you're dead serious about your business, that's what they're looking for. I mean, if these people in your city, they're the guys going to keep coming in from all over around the country and they're there of the room volition. They're not there for any other purpose other than to learn and to be part of um, the network. And uh, how'd you like to hang out with those guys? I mean, I'll give it, for example, um, uh, let's see, Tom Donnelly started out when I met him. I think he had like two duplexes. Now he's, he has built a Airbnb business that, that we're building a program around him for. And he offers the core uh, uh, operations to any Airbnb investor around the country. That that's in less than a year. Okay, uh, Kate Crowell, when I first met her last year, like about a year ago, actually, <laughs> one flip. Now she's doing a twelve million dollar church conversion into a wedding and other e slash events menu. That's the kind of stuff we're talking about. So that means you got to, if you can imagine, if you're one of those guys, who do you want to be working with in your mastermind group? We want other people who had that same level of ambition. So if you got that, in fact, if you guys want to type in here in your question box, say, hey, Gary, that's what I want. <laughs> if you got the ambition to, to give of yourself what it takes to get to that next field of vision, um, just type in, say, Gary, that's what I want, okay? And I'll know who my, uh, I'll know who my action takers are. Um, and by the way, you don't have to impress me, guys. Um, you know, I already know you. Most every one of you, I've probably already met. I already know who you are. I know what you're doing. Um, you know, I've. Uh, I think you're awesome right now. Th this is just really, if you're like, you're, you see it, you're like, you know it, and that's where you belong. That, that, that's who that's for. So, um, so I'll see you guys here, man. So let's get back to the subject tonight. Um, and thanks, Robert, for the question, by the way, too. And thanks. I see your, I see your responses, Shannon. Derek, yeah, Shannon, Derek, you yeah, both you guys, I'd, 
I'd, I'd say if, if I, I don't get a vote, by the way, <laughs> actually, I interview, I interview is what I do. I'll, it's very simple. It's just a simple question. And then, um, you know, you'll meet with the, with the other folks. And uh, so pretty neat people that are awesome, awesome stories. Okay, so back here. Um, back to this. So hope everybody, if you could reread this on your own, hopefully you got enough good notes on this subject. It's, I, it's, it's, the good news is tonight is probably the, one of the more complex ones, but it's really not that complex. I always say this, go to the IRS Gov website, grab the form, grab the instructions, go through an example, all right? And um, you know, you can you can reread this and also get the latest publications on the changes. Um, so let's move on to the next one. Uh, some of these are quite simple. Okay, avoiding or sorry, employ audit proofing techniques to be worry free and, and cost of IRS intervention. I'm going to give you some of these ones, right? You know how a lot of people will say, "Hey, if I work out of my home, I can deduct a certain percentage of my home space." Um, is as a write-off because I'm using it for business. And that may be true. It is true. In fact, you can write off that portion of gas, electric, water, whatever, right? Any expenses related to the home, if 10% of your home is used for business, essentially you can deduct 10% uh, of your home's expenses. However, if you think about what that really means is you don't get that money back. You're just saving whatever your tax bracket is. That. So let's say it ends up being a thousand dollars in a year, you know, you're spending a thousand dollars a month on gas, electric, water, sewage, whatever. And you're in a so that's a that's thousand dollars for the year. Okay. You know what? Let's say it's twelve thousand. Let's say it's a thousand a month. Let's say it's let's up the end. Let's say it's twelve thousand for the year. And you're in a twenty-five percent tax bracket. Okay. What that means is the, the net bottom line effect to you is about three thousand dollars. I know you're thinking, well, that's a lot of money, but I would agree that that's I would love to have three thousand dollars. But here's what I don't like. It is a huge red flag for the IRS when it comes to auditing. OK, it puts you in a higher category. And I don't know about you. If you've ever been through an audit before, I guarantee you, you will spend way more than three thousand dollars in time, energy and money um, going through the audit. I've been audited before. I don't and when I will tell you this. Every one of you can relax. It's not that big a deal. You know, as long as you do things correctly and properly you have nothing to worry about i mean every now and then an error occurs like in fact in 20 was it 2017 no 2015 on my tax return my tax accountant i'm not going to give you his name because he'd be upset if i told it he, he made a mistake he forgot to claim uh one of my income sheet one of the it's called a, a k1 um any case a 1065 report was a filed and recorded and sent to the IRS, but he forgot to take the amount I owned from that business and put it on my personal return. And the IRS just caught it, like literally three years later. And now I've got to pay, I got to pay for it, right? Um, that's an exception. Basically speaking, most audits are because they're looking for information. That's all they're doing. They're just looking for clarification, more information. So what's ironic is in 2015, <laughs> I was audited for 20, oh, wait a second. For 2012, sorry, 2012, big year for me. Um, lots going on, you know, crazy. I mean, the, the divorce, selling businesses, merging businesses. I mean, properties were being sold. It was crazy. And of course, the IRS saw that activity and said, "Well, let's just get some clarification." That's all it was. The cool thing was, I met with the the IRS agent, brought her to my office, said, "Everything's available to you. Whatever you want. Tell me specifically what you want now. I'll give that to you now." Then you tell me what you want next, I'll give you that. Gave her everything she needed, got my tax accountant involved to use the right, the language, okay? So you never just meet with an IRS order on your own. Have your tax accountant with you, prepare you ahead of time, and so you say the right things, okay? A year later, after that audit was finally done, a year, okay? Nothing, there was no change. They wrote me back, said, there's been no change to your return, thank you for cooperation. So I didn't, I never, I wasn't going to jail, I did nothing wrong. But just imagine how much time, energy, and money that cost me during the year. So that's why I don't like, I don't want to avoid any possibility of an audit. So that's one way, one thing to do is just don't do the home office right off. It's just quite frankly, at the end, you're, you're basically working very hard for a few pennies. And it could also raise your chance for an audit. Another thing is this too, um, is always do an extension. And hopefully nobody here is, on, is working for the IRS, but um, Every year I have to do an extension, guys. I mean, I, my, 
I remember the first year my tax return went over 100 pages, just the 1040 part. That's not including all those other additional forms. It was 127 pages. I'm like, holy crap. So in any case, um, we started doing extensions then because the tax accountant, quite frankly, had, didn't have enough time to deal with me during normal tax season because all those other uh, clients were doing just regular 1040s, one or two pages, and they were done. And he makes a lot of money doing that. Um, so for me, for the business people, he'd always tell us, you're going to get an extension, so we do an extension. Now we just do it. We don't even question it. We do an extension. And it gives me time to gather all my information and gather all my data. So that's number two, always do an extension. You can usually do it to, I think it's September for businesses and October for personal returns. Um, gives you more time to gather information, gather data. Now, if you believe you owe money, you still got to pay the money. This is, doesn't mean you don't have to pay. You, you still got to pay. You just don't have to file your return later on. But it does reduce your chances of being audited. They, for some reason, it just reduces your chance of being audited. Okay. In fact, I've been doing this, guys, for over 33 years. I've been aud audited uh, twice, the big one for 2012 that, that occurred three years later. They have three years to audit you, by the way. So don't freak out if somebody, you get a letter in the mail saying we're auditing your 2015 return. Um, it's just, they're just so far behind. They're short-staffed. It's amazing. But in any case, the other one was years before. I can't remember what the heck it was. It was a state audit. I, seriously, one letter. One phone call, and it was done. That was all it was. Okay, so those are the couple big, another one is, says here, is, um, if you ever have something that um, is not like straight and narrow, always give them a written explanation, okay? Um, it never it never hurts, just get to explain to them what you did. Like I had partnerships. I mean, we had things we were doing perfectly legal, but it was getting a little complex and I'm, I like to keep things simple, so it was kind of freaking me out. Um, but what I will tell you is this, is if you think it's complex, provide an explanation, okay? Um, and by the way, the tax code is there to be used. It's not meant to prevent you from earning a living or, or, or building wealth and income. It's, it's actually designed for you to maximize your position in your personal and business lives when it comes to taxes. I say use the tax code. Good, good luck trying to read it, but but that's all we had tax accountants and tax attorneys, okay? We're worth the money. I can tell you, all the money I spent over the years on tax accountants and tax attorneys, I've been the same tax accountant for, good Lord, 20 years now? Is that right? 20 years now. Um, he's getting ready to retire. His son's taking over. I don't know we'll switch, okay? So in any case, um, uh, let's go on to the next subject here. We're starting to kind of tie things up. Okay, understanding that saving taxes accelerates wealth. So what this has to do with here, I'll, I'm going to go kind of past the explanation and give you the, the nuts and bolts here. Okay. Um, oops, sorry. I probably shouldn't have done that. I jumped in. I was thinking I was in another subject. Really, all this has to do with here, guys, is this. Um, remember, we're, what we're talking about is basically – Delaying tax burden. In most cases, you're not you're not avoiding a tax. You're basically delaying a tax. Like for example, 1031 exchange doesn't mean you get to sell a property and don't have to pay capital gains tax. It means you got to sell a property, buy another more expensive property, and then roll that tax burden into the next property. Okay, you're basically getting the current use of those dollars you would have otherwise spent on taxes. Okay. Well, people imagine what that amounts to. I mean, this is what their example is telling us. Let's say you save a thousand dollars. Well, here it is, right here. Let's say you save a um, dollar in your taxes, and it doubles tax-free for 20 years. Okay, at the end of that 20 years, you've made over a million dollars. So what they're saying is, you know, take that same amount, tax every year at 30 percent, you'd be worth only forty thousand dollars. So the point is this: is if you have the temporary use of those dollars use them to create more wealth okay uh instead of paying a tax now so you use these techniques to basically use have the temporary use of the money that's what that example is all about okay it's not an actual technique it's just basically more of a benefit um and by the way everybody always asks for this you want exchanges and the answer is no okay um the, the tax strategy it's a great strategy i, I know people that have done it the challenge is, is um, I'm very conservative, and I do know other people who've used it that wish they hadn't used it. And here's the reason why. Um, 
workarounds, by the way. But let's say you, you've been investing for 20 years and you've done, you've exchanged maybe 10 times in those 20 years. And you've, so now you've delayed how many tens of thousands of dollars in taxes, probably hundreds of thousands of dollars in taxes. But all of a sudden something happens in life. You, you're terminally ill, you need to sell um, because you don't just want to live in a, in, a, uh, in a hospital room for the remaining six months. You want to travel around the world, okay? Uh, remember the, the, what's the movie, The Bucket List, I think it was? Um, it was at, uh, um, in any case, let's get back to the class here. Um, what I'm getting at is this is, if you sell a property down the road and you do not buy another more expensive property, okay, and you did 231 exchange leading up to that point, you've got to pay back all those taxes. And they're not going to just say, oh, yeah, you take all the time you want. I mean, you'll, they'll let you do a workout, but you, they're going to hit you with a bill right up front for the entire amount. Okay, that, that's why. So there's other workarounds. There's things you can do, like um, let's say you own a, a property for you in a building, and you're in a situation where you can't, you're, you would violate the 1031 exchange requirements. What you can do is you can move in the building, make it your, also your, your residence, and live there, I think it's five years, and then you can basically avoid the, um, uh, the 1031 exchange requirement to sell and pay back your taxes. Kind of a neat little trick there, but that's not a very, not very practical kind of a trick if you think about it. I mean, who wants to be moving around every five years when you're in the latter half of your life, right? Yeah, not like me, right? I'm constantly on the move. <laughs> okay, so back here. Uh, let's get to the next one. The appreciation deductions. Uh, I'm going to teach you a concept called componentizing, okay? Cost segregation is the, um, the technical term. One of my former brokers, um, he now is a managing partner for the Marcus Millichap Chicago office, a commercial real estate investor company, um, created his own business doing this years ago. He provided cost segregation services um, to area affluent investors and made a lot of money doing it. But what this means basically is this is, most investors will do the write-off for the property. You know, depreciated over 27 and a half years. The thing is, those other types of property, automobiles, refrigerators, appliances, things like that, had different depreciation scales. In other words, personal property is five years, not 27 and a half years. So what my suggestion is, follow the rules and take whatever the depreciation scale is or the, 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 um, the rate for whatever the component is. So the house itself or the building itself, of course, 27 and a half years. Personal property, if it's five years, take it up for five years. So let's say you installed a um, $80,000 wall, instead of depreciating that over 27 and a half years, depreciate it over the next five years. And if you can imagine, 80,000 divided by five is 16,000. So that means you get to do a, a $16,000 a year write-off, okay, on that component because it's a movable wall, it's not a permanent wall, it's a, it's a per, considered, could be considered personal property, okay? Um, Non-load-bearing non wall, temporary wall. So if you depreciated that over 27 and a half years, you can see you would, you would get uh, one, two, three, about 3,000 a year. And right off, what's better, 3,000 or 16,000? Well, I'd rather take the 16,000 now as a write-off in, instead of 3,000. So that's, that's what they're, they're telling you here. Um, different components have different lifespans. So you always have to look at the rules, okay? Um, and here's all the different rules. I'm not going to go over all these. I just want to explain what componentization is to you. So for those of you, in fact, for those of you who do own your own properties now or have in the past, um, please let me know. Type that in and, and say, yes, Gare, I've got my own properties. And if you haven't already done your tax return yet, guys, um, ask your tax accountant to componentize your tax return to do cost segregation you got to be able to tell him or her whatever you know refrigerators like we bought a, a truck one time from one of our apartment buildings it was so such a big apartment complex it needed its own truck and um what was interesting is we we actually made money on that truck we bought the truck um kept it at the building of course the the on-site person got use of it to get supplies we had a plow on the front to plow the snow in the winter time and a spreader on the back, spread salt. This thing was a beast. We depreciated it. And then when we sold the building, um, 
the complex, we sold the truck separately. And when we added up all the numbers, what we paid for, what we sold it for, what we depreciated it for, we actually made money. Can you imagine that? We made money on that truck. And the thing was beat to hell too. Um, so in any case, so let me go back here real quick. Um, so Crystal's asking, you're saying they have both tax account and tax attorney. Um, so Crystal, let me clarify. In the beginning, you probably just need a tax accountant. You probably don't need a tax attorney right now. If you start uh, building multiple businesses and having uh, you know, hundreds of properties and thousands of units and things like that, you're probably going to need somebody on retainer, okay? Um, I, I do. I'm mean, the, the attorney I've had. I've also had. My oh gosh, that's been over 20 years too. So um, I like. And by the way, write this down, guys. Here's how I choose the people that do that type of work for me. Guess what my number one criteria is? Let's see if you guys can figure it out. So type in what you think the criteria is. What What's one question I ask them? If they're if I own real estate and they're preparing my tax returns. Um, um, that's right. Do they own properties themselves or have they in the past? So I only choose people that also have real estate because then I know they know what I'm doing. They know I know what to expect from them. They, they know what to expect from me. Great relationship. So I always uh, uh, look for referrals. I always ask them, hey, by the way, ever considered investing in real estate? Sounds like a sales pitch. And by the way, that's how I started off. I wanted to sell real estate to the guy, you know, and he said, in fact, in fact, I do. And right away, the light bulb went off. And I said, can you give me some other uh, clients you have who also own real estate? And uh, I started a whole big relationship, an amazing. And by the way, started uh, also fed my uh, uh, community investor group, guys. So keep that in mind. Every contact, tax attorney, tax lawyer, they've all got plenty of clients. Ask them about the ones that invest themselves and offer to do like a picnic um, or a whatever, something, a dinner. All right. And invite them to your workshop. So Robert, uh, yeah, I remember that Robert. So Robert's got some rentals. Crystal does. Uh, Robert hit the nail on the head. You're right, Robert. And Shannon, you got the answer too, right? Thanks, guys, for doing that. Okay, so let's go back here. Um, let's see. Generate repair deductions. Employee strategies to reclassify rehab improvements into full deductible repairs. Okay, so here's what they have to do with guys. Um, there is a tax rule. I think it's called tax rule 172. I don't know if it's in here or not. And I've actually deployed that over the years, for a lot of years. OK. What it means is you can take a capital improvement like a new roof and instead of depreciating the roof over the life of the building, for example. You can take the write off for the entire roof job in the year you took the hit. OK, called tax rule 172. Now, here's the restriction. Some tax accounts will say, no, you can't do that. That's only for businesses. And I'm like, well, good, because my real estate holdings are a business. And here's the rule. If you own them in your own name, you should probably not take the 172 rule because you can get audited on that. But if all your properties are owned within LLC or a separate LLC or separate LLCs, guess what? That's in a business. It's got its own tax ID. It's got its own income expense. And then you can use tax rule 172. I'm not a tax accountant. I'm not a tax attorney. I'm just telling you, this has been my experience. Okay, so um, so that's what I would do there. And we've used that in years. What we would do is we look at our position. Okay, income expense, profit loss, you know, asset liability. Look at our tax position and figure out how to best position our return um, to minimize the tax burden. And we use tax for 172 as one of the main tools to be able to do that. We would, in some years, write off more and more capital improvements in other years we write off fewer capital improvements as expenses and just leave them as capital improvements okay um so that's what that's talking about there great strategy if any of you guys have used these before just say hey gary yeah use that it works great you know save a couple thousand bucks i mean every time you do one of these my gosh i mean i've you know i mean many of you are, are, are trainees you're in one of the training programs and you probably spent two two grand unless you're uh, in one of the offices I taught it then and they give it to you for, for uh, sorry, three grand, they give it to you for half of that, 1500 Regardless, one of these tax strategies here could probably pay for the program just on one one property, okay? The tax saving was on one property. Okay, uh, here's a neat strategy if you're first starting out, pretty obvious. Um, you can take advantage of FHA financing by buying anything up to a four unit and living in one of the units and you get traditional 
uh, FHA financing, 30-year amortization, low interest rates, the whole nine yards. Um, my first property I bought was half of a house. It wasn't a duplex. It was a four-bedroom, two-bathroom house in Virginia Beach, Virginia. My college roommate, Socrates, bought the other half. We rented out the other two rooms. So we essentially used a strategy. I mean, our out-of-pocket cost, guys, in those years, those months were $50 a month each. That was it. I mean, we were knuckleheads. We went out and bought boats and did all kinds of crazy stuff that 222, 23 year old boys do when they have money and a home and, and, and free time and living by the ocean. <laughs> so, in any case, uh, I'm much more mature now. All right, so back to this uh, real easy strategy, easy to understand. Uh, let's see. Okay, here's some neat strategies. This is kind of a um, conglomerate of strategies here. Um, let's see, when you buy rental properties, I like. I used to, guys, I used to buy properties that needed a lot of work. I mean, quite frankly, they were, <laughs> you know, they just needed work. And um, that was, it was always value add type transactions. Um, but they were a lot of times not completely occupied. I learned when I buy a ready made a property that's in production, fully rented, I'm producing money on day one. I'd rather do that and have management issues than buy a property with physical deferred maintenance repair issues. Um, I'm just telling you over the years, I've learned um, you can manage through problems more quickly than you can uh, make repairs and get inspections and list a property for rent and rent it. All that kind of stuff takes time. And plus the, the property is sitting there by making money while you're doing that. I'd rather have a property make money from day one. All right. Next thing is this is if you have a regular full time job for a regular employer, you can borrow typically up to half of your 401k. I did that a lot. OK. You can you can uh, borrow against the cash value of your whole life policy. You can pull out your cash value. You don't have to though. So a lot of people think, well, when you borrow against your whole your whole life insurance policy, you that you lose that benefit. You take the money out. That's true if you do it that way. But there are companies, finance companies, that will give you a loan based on the cash value of your whole life policy without touching your whole life policy. Okay. A uh, whole new strategy, we'll talk about it another night because it's another, that would be an hour long discussion. But just know that that's possible. And by the way, um, interesting strategy with that is if you have other properties, they will let you um, borrow against the equity in those other properties. All right. And knowing you've got a, a, a cash value whole life policy for, say, say your cash value is a half million dollars, you could get a lot of money in a loan. And all you honestly, what you do is they have you get a separate term life policy on your on your your life, okay? And they get the payout of the whole life policy if you if you die before the loan's paid off, and you still get a term life policy uh, to protect you and your family. It's a great strategy. Okay, another one is this: is um, uh, you can get a commercial line of credit, which is what I did many many times against my portfolio. Um, and by the way, using cash. See, a lot of people have this philosophy. No money down. I don't want to buy properties or use any money to buy properties. That's that's a limited approach. The fact is, is using cash is often an excellent, excellent strategy. So let's say the market starts to pull back, which it did in the, in the Great Recession. Um, if you ever wonder why I'm on a cash basis now, remember a lot of you I've told I in class I'm on a cash basis. It's because I know we're good, we're heading into another cycle. I can't tell you when the bottom is going to drop out. I just know that we are, and um, it's going to be Christmas time. So I'll buy as much as I can buy, leveraging the best way I can to maximize the use of my cash. But the point is, is the market, because the market turns around and property values go up, I can go out and refinance and put brand new first mortgages on those properties and recoup my cash. What you think is a better return on your money? You follow what I'm saying? So that's why cash is often at the end of the day, the position you want to be in. It gives you so much more possibilities, flexibility, leverage opportunities, get the best prices, everything is so much easier when you operate from cash. Um, matter of fact, that's one of my big hopes and wish and prayers for you is that uh, through everything I teach you, it will inspire you to go through the techniques, build as much as you want to build right now, and, and at some point shift your strategy to work towards being on a cash basis, and it'll you actually will grow bigger. Counterintuitive, I know it sounds like, well, I'll grow slowly if I work with cash. That's just your, what you're seeing in front of you. When you see the big vision, and I'll show you to you this weekend, by the way, um, you'll see why that's a much better longer term strategy. So, okay, uh, let's see here. 
uh, voided FCPAs. Yeah. Matter of fact, I kind of just talked about it. Um, I only like using CPAs who are working with other investors and or invest themselves. And, you know, one of the old tricks is ask them how much two and two plus two is. If they say four, you fire them. It's an old, it's an old joke within the accounting world, tax accounting world. But the point is this is I want my tax attorney to use the rules to my advantage. I just want to know which rules to use that create the least chance of an audit and also allow me to maximize my tax position because I am conservative. So that's who I look for. Um, so I ask him those questions. I ask him and say, well, once you look at my information before you've actually uh, finished the return, I want you to call me and let's go over some of the strategies you used and you can go over your tax return that way and see what strategies they use. Okay. Um, and then you can decide if you want to go forward with a tax accountant that year and the next year. Um, okay. In any case, so lots of other things here for you to look at. We're going to skip through to the last one, uh, but, but look at these questions in your document. Just pull it off the My Investment Services website and use that as a homework assignment if you want to. Um, in any case, uh, do not over over tax rent income. This is kind of obvious, but believe it or not, I know people that have sadly have paid Social Security tax on their rental income. You don't have to do that. It's, you don't. I mean, it's it's a uh, it's passive income. You don't pay Social Security on passive income. You only pay Social Security on earned income. Okay. So in any case, uh, make sure no matter what you do, you're not paying taxes. You're not paying Social Security tax on your rental income. It's called passive income. Okay. Um, in any case, uh, when purchasing your next rental property, alter who pays for various expenses on the HUD one. Okay, this is the last strategy. This is one I came up with on my own years ago. And I use this a lot when I'm in a situation where either me or one of my clients is very close on negotiating on a deal. And we're within maybe, you know, two or three percentage points at the most. We're, we're, we're not quite there. We're two or three percentage points apart. Um, what I'll do is I'll restructure the deal, like I'll lower the, the price and I'll have my buyer take the seller's expenses, commissions, transfer taxes, the whole nine yards. And here's what I do. I make sure I understand my, my client's tax position. What bracket are they in? They have 25% bracket, 15% bracket, whatever the bracket is. Okay. And I'll tell them, I say, look, you're about, let's just say we're at a, you're looking at a hundred thousand dollar property. and their buyer and seller are three thousand apart. The seller wants one hundred thousand. The buyer thinks it's only worth ninety-seven. What you can do is just say, "Look, Mr. Seller, my buyer is willing to pay you ninety thousand, but take all of your expenses, your commission that you got to pay, which is six percent. That's six thousand there. Transfer taxes, say that's four percent. That's ten percent right there. That's ten thousand dollars right there. And then you add in a few other little little tidbits." Um, you know, if you want to. But the bottom line is just with the transfer tax and the commission combined 6% and 4%, it comes to 10%. You're down to 90,000. That's the net that the seller would have gotten anyways when they paid, after they paid out the commission and the transfer taxes, right? So what you can do is you can shift that over to the to the buyer. So the buyer gets the property for 90,000. So his cost basis is lower, okay? Um, but, and also his loans lower, everything's lower, down payments lower, all that. But what happens is, at tax time, he gets to write that off. And if he's in a, a you know, 35% tax bracket, he gets 3,500 of those dollars back, okay, 3,500 of the 10,000. So he ended up giving the 3,000 the seller wanted, but he ended up making 500 on the tax at the, at the tax time. You follow where I'm going with this? Great strategy. Helps you get a deal go through, and it also, uh, net, net effect to the seller, there's no effect to them tax tax wise. To the buyer, they get a little bit of a tax advantage. Okay, let me go back to the questions here, guys, because I've got to get on a Facebook Live event. So B, Robert says, BP is calling for house hacking. Guess what we're going to talk about this weekend, Robert? That's one of the subjects on Saturday after the afternoon break. Uh, Diego Corzo is going to talk about how he got started in real estate by house hacking. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, this is Crystal's asking. Number six, you said that's for four units or less. Yeah, so FHA will let you buy anything up to a four unit crystal and still consider it a residential property for loan purposes, insurance, everything. It's all residential rules. 
Uh, and if you live in there, you get to use it as a personal residence and a personal loan rate and term and not a commercial loan rate and term. So um, great question. Thank you very much. Um, okay, guys, listen, I'm going to jump over here to Facebook Live and start that. But uh, a great subject. We do this every year. <laughs> um, I know it's not like the most exciting stuff. Not like last week. Last week, Shannon, thank you, Shannon, because that was an awesome session uh, based on something that was that was really, I think, necessary to be discussed. So um, God bless you guys. I look forward to seeing you this weekend. Um, the next webinar is next Wednesday at same day, same 4 p.m. Pacific. I'll see you there, and I'll also we'll see you this weekend. Guys, come prepared to learn. Be prepared. Give me your all this weekend because I'm going to give you my all too. Okay, guys? Um, all right. God bless you and your families, and we will see you in a couple days. Bye-bye.